Um, I'm Laura Secord, Nancy, you did a beautiful job. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And um, I'm very excited because I just published my first book with a real publisher that I didn't self-publish, An Art of Craft and Mystery. And this is a book of, uh, this is a novel told in poems. Um, it is a historical novel. It's also a feminist novel. And it is the story of two of my ancestors who were accused of witchcraft in the 1600s along the Connecticut River. And I'm gonna be talking to you about this book today and reading you a lot from it. So you'll be able to enjoy some of the poems. Um, I wanna start by just telling you how I got and I even found out about these women because I didn't know about them. My husband is a genealogist. And one day I was working on another project and he came in the room where I was working and he said, well, your great, 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 great was found guilty of witchcraft in Connecticut. And then he showed me an article that was written about this. Now, if you can remember back to American Heritage Magazine, my family used to subscribe to it when I was a kid. Um, and there was an article in there in the probably like this um, 1960s. And the article told about my ancestor, Lydia Gilbert, who very little information is available on. There's really nothing written about her except the, um, her accusation in her court case. That's it. And this is what was the quote, the historical quote from data. Um, about her on November the 24th, 1654, they said about her, Lydia Gilbert, thou ha art here indicted for not having the fear of God, for thou hast given entertainment to the great enemy of God. His help hath killed Henry Stiles' body. Besides other witchcrafts, according to God's law, thou deservest death. That is the only documentation about Lydia Gilbert, who is my great, 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 great aunt. Um, so from that, uh, writer John Demis had written a four or five page American Heritage article talking about what an evil woman this woman was. No information to prove that, but just the assumption that someone called a witch, a woman called a witch would have to be very evil and a lot of made up stuff. So I felt like, you know, I got to write about this woman, but I also thought, ooh, the Puritans, those perfect women in those perfect gray outfits with those perfect white hats and collars, serving people at Thanksgiving dinner, everybody doing the same thing, thinking the same thing and obeying what they are told. And I really didn't want to write about it. Um, but I am so blessed to have married this anthropologist, historian, genealogist, who instead of giving me historical works to read, gave me two books to read that were more anthropological, that talked about archaeological digs of early settlements that have shown that what we learned in school about that group of people, though, that Puritan society, is not the way it was. Now, I'm not much of a historian, so I hadn't studied any of this, but reading these anthropological texts, especially there was one called 1491 that told what this country was like before it was settled and what an organized and civilized and advanced culture, the indigenous culture was, that was completely wiped out through disease before the Connecticut River was even settled. So it gave me a different perspective. But I also knew that I had to learn about what women's lives were like because there really is nothing hardly documented about women. Women were not really even allowed to write at that time in England. After uh, Queen Elizabeth passed and James took over, women were discouraged from learning to read or write. The Puritans, from what I understood, wanted women to read so they could read the religious text, but did not encourage women to learn to write. 
So there are very few writings by women from that early um, settlement of this country's time period. One is the poet Anne Bradstreet, which Nancy and I talked about the other day. Anne Bradstreet did write poetry that was very powerful, but she always made a little excuse at the end that she was really more religious than anything else. Even at, in her most erotic poem, she still comes back to, you know, God's gonna take care of it. Um, and then there's a couple of um, memoirs or not memoirs, journals written by women who had were kidnapped by um, some of the indigenous folks. And there's not too much else. So when you're trying to understand the lives of women at that time, it takes a historian that can dig deep into probate records and court records and things I was not familiar with doing. Um, but I read a wonderful book that really helped me a lot. It was written by Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, who is a historian at Harvard. She wrote the book, The Midwife's Tale, if you remember probably about 20 years ago, that book I think got a Pulitzer. And uh, she had found a midwife's diary and had condensed it and turned it into a book. So I read her work, Good Wives, which tells about the lives of women at that time. And from that, there was a quote in that, and that began this book. It was the first poem that I wrote, and it turns out that it's the title poem of the book as well, and I'd like to share that with you. It's called An Art, a Craft, a Mystery. We kept the small alive from day to day, kept households warm, kept bread made, while men sat in the meeting house in ceaseless debate on sin, redemption, destiny, their grace came through women's works, watching fires and keeping coals ablaze, and their salvation through women's hands, gathering each day's yeasted scraps for tomorrow's meal our sacred pact. Don't think these skills were simple. They were an art, a craft, a mystery. Yet when the men took notice, they questioned diligence and named it witchery. So not knowing much, that was the first thing I wrote. Um, and I, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research I did and also share with you from the beginnings of this book. So I also discovered that I had a cousin named Kate or Catherine Gilbert Harrison, who um, was also accused of witchcraft. So I had these two characters. And I brought them, some of the things I, I have in the book are very true, they come from data. But there's a lot that has to come from imagination because there's not much out there. But different from the John Demis version of these women as evil, mean, cruel harpies, I wanted to make them real women, real ordinary women who were living their lives and got caught up in accusations. But I had to get them to this country first. So I'm gonna read you two poems that talk about why Lydia and Kate left England and came here. And the first poem is called Hasty Rose Ring. And like all their, my poems, they're in the voice of one of the characters that's called Persona Poetry. Um, and this poem is in the voice of Lydia Gilbert. Hasty Rose Ring. One rosy morn in spring, I find my man home from the seas. We celebrate and sing. Our babies climb his lap. He kisses me. With the shilling from spinning, I buy us party treats, a special feast for daddy's sea dog yarns. The children screech and giggle but he falls to coughing. I'm hopeful wrapped in his arms, a stifled cough, shaking, 
his body shivers. I hold a sick man at midnight. Flushed with fever. I've hear, heard sad yarns. This one comes true. My mates were ailing. And still you sing? So glad to see our babies. I, I want to be their treat. I brew him tea and rub his back beside me. Dawn finds me worried. He spews his breakfast on me. I wake up Kate, watch them. I go to cure his cough. I see a chemist syrup. I hope will treat his weakening, made from ginger to heal the man I've longed for through two springs. I sing a prayer for healing. By dusk, I see our family's yarn phrase towards swelling grief. Infested yarns unravel all our joys. Kate, get these babies from me. Come, your Don needs sleep. They huddle up while Kate sings a ballad of love and loss as Richard coughs and coughs. He's hellish hot and ringed with red. This man is dying. A curse I can't begin to treat. Time compresses. Is this the death of which they sing? I turn to see my wee ones failing. Can't treat them fast enough to save them. All three coughing. My Kate tries hard. We nurse them together. Our yarn runs to its hasty end where red rings glare at me. Kate runs for help. The surgeon says, it's plague, kid. Shaken, can't sing. I've lost my man, my babies. No treatment worked by Kate or me. We've lived the darkest tale, yet we're not coughing. So there is, I'm gonna read one more poem from this section. I'm sorry, they're so sad. Um, this is Lydia's response to losing her family and how she, what she does. It's called After the Plague. My husband dead, my babies gone, all love a failing. Why not me? To glorify their tender souls, I strive to nurse those suffering and work to tend the living. Why not me? My Hal, my Viola, my Rosemary, I nourish strangers' children in your names, sustain lives or witness their passing. Why not? Through scourge-infested alleys, Kate and I cradle child after child. Still this bane of buboes, chills, and fear subdues their frames. Why not mine? Keeping memories alive, I cross the lanes of hell. Penance. Why not me? So from that, you can see that there's nothing left in this country for them. And one of the best solutions at the time for a woman with nothing would be to indenture themselves for passage. So that's what Kate, uh, that's what Lydia decides to do. She books the two of them on a ship called the True Love that heads for Massachusetts Bay Colony. Now, I want to tell you just a little bit about my experience before I read you the next poem. There's kinds of research that we do when trying to write something that, that you, makes you understand the lives of people whose lives you've never been part of. And uh, one of that is the reading of secondary research like Laurel Ulrich's book. And one of them is reading 
and getting your hands on some primary research. But what really, really changed my approach to this book was having an experiential research. So I was lucky enough to get a fellowship at Poet Marilyn Nelson's Soul Mountain Retreat up um, north of New Haven and decided that since I had received that fellowship, I, my husband and I would go first and we would hit some of these archeological sites and these reproductions or, of original settlements in this country. So we went to the Plymouth Plantation, um, which was developed by two archeologists that had dug the old plantation up and actually figured out what the homes were like, the gardens were like and everything. And then we went to visit a reproduction of the Mayflower. Now these experiences were just tremendous to me and impacted this book so much because I could see what it was like. I could feel what it was like to be there, which I could not possibly imagine. But it was the experience on the Mayflower reproduction. Being in this tiny little space of the hold of a ship that had, was full of 80 people and seeing how tiny and tight that was. It had such an impact on me that when I got off the boat, I just you know, sat in the parking lot and cried. And soon after that, the voices of these women started coming to me, even though they weren't on the Mayflower reproduction, they were on a ship called the True Love. And so I wanna read one poem that takes place on the True Love and you can already tell that Lydia has a touch with healing and she's also has a touch with midwifery. And this poem is called Labor and Delivery and the voices of Lydia and Kate alternate in this poem. So you'll hear from each of them. Labor and Delivery, one, Lydia. With little room for even a bit of privacy, I bribe the mate with ginger sticks to help me prepare a travail place for a frightened girl to have her baby. We hang scrap sails, fill the space with straw and shavings, make plans to heat the water. Brackish will do if boiled. We stitch sheets with torn bedclothes and with any willing woman's skirt scraps. The red-haired Irish sailor says, I make him recall the Papist sisters, for I am so determined in my work. I begin to teach the birth breath and assure her green husband all can be safe, even with the tossing waves. Two, Kate. I worried all these past days that Molly, huge belly, hardly able to walk and making water constantly, would birth her child on these rough seas. Her pains began on wild water, all in darkness this past night. Aunt and I had just prepared a place in the storage of the ship's bow. Molly's eyes were full of dread, but Lydia, with a clear, direct voice, instructed well, helping her to birth without a tear. All the passengers are now amazed. They expected screams of pain, but only heard the deep breath, the fast breath, the dog's pant, as we told her, push, push now. Then a healthy son's lusty cry. He sucks teeth mighty well. So bringing Lydia and Kate to the colonies, I was doing some reading and I read a biography of Anne Hutchinson. Now I'm not sure, I see some nods. So some of you may know of Anne Hutchinson. Anne Hutchinson was accused of heresy in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and um, banished from the colony. The reason she was a threat to the colonizers was that she was an incredible preacher. She was also a midwife and a healer, so she knew the community well. And she began to give 
sermons at her home to women of the colony. But the sermons became popular with the men. And so there was some conflict in the community about whether or not it was correct for a woman to preach at all. And also her um, philosophy was a little different than the, than the prevalent philosophy in the Puritan community. I tried to read about some of those religious and spiritual, spiritual conflicts. It was almost too much for me. Mm -hmm. I did not understand why we were arguing about these things. Um, but I'm a modern woman. So I, I, one of my readers, my early readers told me I needed a poem in this book that explained that because people would not understand because as it turns out, Lydia and Kate end up being indentured in the home of Anne Hutchinson. And from that, they get to learn from Anne about her approach to life. And, the, and Anne has a great impact on the characters. So what I'm gonna read to you now is a poem that gives the voices of the two governors of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, Henry Vane, who was the more liberal governor, who was replaced and elected out, and the position was given to John Winthrop, who was much more conservative in his perspective. So I'm gonna read you that poem because it kind of lays out the issues. And then I'm going to read a poem in the voice of Kate about Anne's, um, trial and a voice in the, in the uh, poem in the voice of Lydia. And I think one of the things these two poems do is it kind of shows you the different approaches these two characters are going to take to their own lives later on. The first poem is called The Hutchinson Debate. And I'm gonna have a sip of water because I can already tell I'm getting dry. The Hutchinson Debate and it, the, the two voices you're going to hear are Henry Vane and John Winthrop and for a moment, you will also hear the voice of Anne Hutchinson. The Hutchinson debate, Henry Vane versus John Winthrop. Come along, I'll bring you to a woman who preaches better gospel than your black coats. A dangerous error. A woman of another kind of spirit who has had many revelations, overstepping the boundaries from the kitchen and the nursery, renowned as a sympathetic healer, an open door to sin, capable of helping women raise families in this hostile world. She supersedes the Bible, church, and ministers. A woman who has healed them, who talked to them, who led them, endowed with magnetism, the breeder and nourisher of all distemper. As much as 80 women come to her hanging on her every word, more bold than any man, resolving doctrine, explaining scripture. <coughs> One with God's grace in their heart cannot go astray. Laws and edicts are proper only for men, for those laws and edicts are for those with a personal union with the Holy Ghost. This assertion of personal communion with God is rebellion. The free gift of God's grace needs strict discipline. Membership in the covenant of grace is not for the disorderly. Her knowledge comes from revelation with cunningly colored opinions. Serene enough in her faith, she will never doubt the state of her soul. It's time for this woman to be subdued once and for all. <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me, doing that voice. It's not my real one. Okay, one more drink. All right, so now we hear what the men thought. Now we're gonna take with Kate 
to the trial of Anne Hutchinson. And this poem is called Before Ministers and Magistrates. Kate, Mistress Anne is going on trial for heresy at the Cambridge Meeting House. Her toddler, Zeria, still nurses at night, so I was chosen to come along and watch him at her eldest daughter's home. His ma'am already kissed his head goodbye, but he's restless and our calming walk leads us to the meeting house door. The hall is filled. I stand beside the cracked daub round the window frame and peer inside. The magistrates and ministers are dressed in solemnity, yet the throng outside is noisy as a carnival. I hear the crier announce, good wife, Anne Hutchinson. And then I see her, pale yet all her own self, walking head high, eyes direct into that empty space where she will stand before them. Zuriel clings in my arms, his heart races, but he stays quiet. Then all those that love her, the women she has nursed and midwife, women and men enraptured by her sermons at her weekly conventicles begin to shout and cheer. I want to know her fearlessness. Zeriel trembles as if to whimper. I stroke his arm, mutter kisses to his face. She stands alone while those that judge her are seated with warm coals at their feet. What have I said or done? She asks this to our governor once and once again. What law do I transgress? I feel Zuriel screaming, squeam, excuse me. I feel Zuriel squirming and I do not want mistress to notice. So I take the baby out before the sea and we twirl while his mother's ordeal spins before us. Waves, homes, hills, forest, skies and her billowing courage as Zuriel squeals with delight. All right. So I, you know, I see my uh, allergies are really acting up today. After all that storm last night. Okay, now I want to read one more poem about Anne Hutchinson's trial. But this is from Lydia's point of view, just to get an idea of the difference between these two characters. And this is called To Break Her. Mistress Anne is in bondage, under house arrest at the home of a minister. Bereft, master comes to get her things. Not her husband or her children are allowed to see her for four months. She will sit alone in a plain room with no work to free her mind. They plan to break her, reduce her, force her to let go of her ideals and lay herself open to the clergy. My mind sees her in repose, lit by a light shaft from an attic window. Fearless daughter and ardent service to his word, believer that all have a right to his love, even woman, even servant girl. I see her floating in a boat of grace, confident, innocent, naked, afloat on her truths, doubtless even in her suffering and isolation, willing to endure any punishment to confirm her faith. All right, so. 
that now we know Anne Hutchinson's going to be banished. And as the story goes, she sets um, both Kate and Lydia free of their indenturement, but says, you got to get wherever you're going on your own. I got nothing else to give. And so our two heroines take off by foot in winter across from Massachusetts Bay to the Connecticut River Valley. Um, and end up with their cousins uh, south of Hartford and find that although their cousins are welcoming, there's not very much room in the very small settlement that they've developed. So they end up taking positions. Lydia takes a position north of Hartford in Windsor. And Kate takes a position with Colonel Cullock in Hartford. So I just want to read a poem or two from that period of time in the women's lives. Um, <clears throat> just a minute, let me make sure I'm not going to start coughing again in the middle of the poem. Okay. Uh, Lydia and her nephew Thomas end up going to, to work for a man named Henry Stiles. And this is the story of Henry Stiles. And um, it's called The Widow Widower, and it's in the voice of Lydia Gilbert. When he lost his wife and son, Henry Stiles built grief. Sickness killed them with bloody coughs, spilling grief. Though his church does not allow it, saying God's plans can't be questioned, he dwells in grief. Though sorrow is idle and tainted with evil, he can't be done. Though it's not and never will be his will to grieve. Eating poorly, leaving his fields untended and his cows, their udders almost bursting, not milked and ever feeling, filling his grief. Below the rocky hill, above the marshy meadows, his family summon help from those Gilberts, not kilt by grieving. Ever seeking a new future, Thomas asks if I will join him. Lydia gladly answers, her heart's instilled with grief. And one more poem from that time. Below the ground, Lydia. Thomas and I serve Henry Stiles, a marsh away from the great river in a cellar house, dug halfway in the ground. Slat shingles, one door, two low windows, two placed high to draw the smoke like a chimney an open fire pit, daub walls blackened. I, tending three fires at once, can spit roast, stew, and bake. Outdoors, untended gardens, weedy corn and peas, thorny meadows for the stock. We strive and toil for Stiles Farm, hoping Thomas will earn a patch of land. Yet, to move about a place where my hands can touch and bend and my influence amend such neglected beauty gratifies my day. So that's a little about where Lydia ends up. And Catherine, or Kate, ends up in the home of a captain, so a much nicer place. <laughs> and she's a servant. And this is a little story about what it's like to live in the Culloch home um, from Kate. And it's called Storied Talk. Mistress Culloch talks and talks, chattering all through the prescribed time for our edification. Her ladies-in-waiting, she calls us, 
that were not ladies, only servant girls, who she trains in embroidery skills each afternoon once our toils temporarily complete. Our days begin in darkness, where we complete first chores, start the fire, gather eggs, no talking till the captain and mistress awake. They critique our skill at serving them like lords and ladies spending time on a wilderness holiday. Mistress gathers her girls after midday meal, is served and cleared, calling, come, come now, the light is ripe for sewing. Mistress calls my handiwork atrocious. It's never complete, for she makes me pull my threads out, my worst girl. I turn her strident voice, incessant talk off. How her noble captain wasted no time in burning out the Pequot tribe. His skills in killing savages highly praised. Commend a man's skill and social standing when talking about him. I don't finish my sampler in time. My threads leave holes in the linen. I'll never compete. The sunlight fades. I hear the call, cows call for milking, the pigs for slop, just a low girl once again. After dark, I became another girl who pretends among her peers to have a skill with fortune telling. Our palettes spread, we talk. I tell the story of a crone who called me over and sold me a package complete with gilded letters, writ money rain. Stuffed with time, I thought it predicted prosperous times, but I've remained a lowly serving girl. I offer fortunes from my book of astrology and complete each with some lucky fate. Let them believe my skill. Let them think that I am more than what mistress calls me. Creating new worlds in our attic talks, fantastic visions completed with my special skill, painting pictures of girls with fortunes called well wrought. I elevate myself with storied talk. So hopefully that gives you a little sense of the difference between these two characters. Um, I'm gonna, I, let's, I'm gonna check my time, okay? <laughs> okay? Okay, so I have a little bit longer. I'm gonna, I don't wanna do a giveaway because I really would love you to read this book. Um, it is available in Birmingham at Thank You Books, also at Little Professor. And if you have another favorite bookstore, going in and ordering it is very, very possible. Um, you can also order from the press, Livingston Press, and um, Rowena is going to email you with all these links for where you can order these the book. So I don't want to give away too much of what happens, since I want you to read it. <laughs> so no, I'm trying to avoid too many spoilers, um, but I want to tell you just a little bit about Lydia's life on um, the Connecticut River, and. Interestingly enough, now when you get the book, you can really see, but there is a map in the book that I found at the Windsor Historical Society that actually shows Henry Stiles property and shows the property the Gilberts were hoping to, to earn and shows the homes of some other folks that um, lived in the colony. And because I was smart enough to marry a historian, did I know I was so smart? No. Um, but my husband got me a digital copy of the colonial court records of early Connecticut. And I was able to read about these people that lived in the colony, especially the ones that had a court case. So I'm gonna um, read you one poem that comes from that period. Um, you, I can't show you on the map where this character lives, okay? But if you had it, 
and you had a magnifying glass. Unfortunately, it needs to be a really a bigger map to read it well. But I'm gonna read you a poem about um, something I, I discovered in the court records. And I was able to actually see where these characters lived and I could visualize that Lydia might be asked to help them since she was a midwife and healer. So this poem is called A Lashing in the voice of Lydia. A Lashing. I am called to the house of Goodman H.D. to dress the whip marks on his wife's back. The court ordered six stripes to her naked back in a public display on the Palisado Green as punishment for a voice too brash and harsh. Standing at a distance, I saw the crowd gather round her small frame, men with muskets ready and women glaring. As they flogged her bare skin, her arms fought bravely to cover her breasts. Now the wounds have festered, angry red and leaking amber pus. I warm water and loosen her shifts, rip threads stuck deep in the whip's ruptures. She bursts apart with tears. Let them flow, cleanse that memory. I pack her wounds with linen smeared in calendula and goose fat. It took courage to endure such shaming. Oh, the same true voice that gives a man great glory brings the pain and sorrow we women suffer for. Just a touch of Lydia's experience and her healer along the river. Um, okay, now I also wanted to read a poem because I, you know, I don't have too many other characters' voices in this work besides Lydia and Kate, but I felt like I had to give Henry Styles a voice. And part of that reason is because of what I read about the founding of these early colonies along the Connecticut River, many of which were um, left by the indigenous folks who were killed off by a huge hepatitis A viral plague um, that the traders brought to these people who did not have the immune system to fight it. And this is what was found when the settlers arrived were homes and farms and food stores and all kinds of things that they would have called the God's providence. But it was actually stuff that had work that had been done by a settled culture that had been there long before, uh, before the colonizers. And so I'd like to read this little piece to you. It's called Early Windsor and it's in the voice of Henry Stiles. And it's in a journal form, okay? So it'll sound kind of journalistic. Part one, 1634 settlement, 10 May, Francis, this is Henry's brother, agreed to act as emissary for Lord Saltonstall. Come dawn, we sail to the colonies to claim the land grant. 16 October, we disembark after seas and a great river my brother Francis tells the settlers to call him Lord. 18 October, given dead Indian land, a village passed away, victims of a trader's plague, the jaundice dropsy. 20 October, our providence, the native stores, Grain, beans, squash, dried fish, jerky, hides, and pottery, their fire pits and tilled fields. 31 October. Last night, a screaming wind, tortured souls and children's ghostly cries, unsettling. Part two, 
1636 trade. Two September, floods and failed crops. Our native stores are spent. Five November, cursed, we are starving. 12 November, Traded my musket to an Indian for ground corn and a share of hunted game. 15 November, my brother feeds on my venison and fritters with red tree syrup. I tell him of my barter. 24 November, Francis complains to the court about my bargain. 25 November, a day shackled in the stocks. 18 February, the Indian keeps leaving waterfowl on my door. Francis feeds his family the meat of my disgrace. So tells you a little bit about Henry, gets you a little bit of an idea of what a wonderful character Francis will be later on as well. Um, let's see how I'm doing here, because I really want to cut a couple. Okay, we got 10 more minutes. So um, let's see. All right, I'm, um, I'm not going to, I don't want to tell you too much about the story, but I do want to tell you about, I want to read a poem to you that talks a little about um, women's pockets. Uh, Laurel Ulrich is very big on the story of women's pockets. You know, they weren't like pockets that we have not now, a little pocket you can put your hand in. They were a huge bag that fit under a waistband that made your skirt stick out a little. I always used to think that was, that was there. If you've seen any um, early, that time period clothing of women, there would be an underskirt and then there would be this big thick waistband. And I can't remember the name of it right now. And it would make you look hippier. And, you know, I used to think it was for the decoration of making women's hips look larger, but actually it kept your outer skirt away from your pocket, which was actually a huge thing that carried all kinds of stuff that you needed. And I wanted to, you know, write a, I wrote a poem about pockets in Lydia's voice. And I want to read that one to you. Um, it's called My Pockets. My pockets carry sentimental pieces. These womb-shaped bags hang below my skirts, protecting simple, precious things. Locks of my children's hair and linen strings, a sharp blade, scrap cloth squares. Protecting simple, precious things. Wrapped in a piece from my mother's shift, a sharp blade, scrap cloth squares, scattered bones I gathered on the green. Wrapped in a piece from my mother's shift, remnants of loss and change I spread before me. Scattering bones I gathered on the green. A rat arranging the lasting bits from things extinct. Remnants of loss and change. I spread before me hiding needed things, tools for nourishing, arranging the lasting bits from things extinct. My pockets carry sentimental pieces. So we're gonna move to Kate for a minute and, or for a little bit, because Lydia might disappear from the story at somewhere along the line. Uh, but y'all know that these women were accused of witchcraft. So I think I can read one more poem from Lydia's perspective before I move on. And I read the quote, a quote from this poem early and when I, it's, it's the quote that I first discovered Lydia on, but this is Lydia's perspective of that story instead of John Damison's. And the, this poem is called 24 November, 1654. The magistrates wear clean lace 
linen collars to read my verdict. The magistrates wear clean white linen lace. They sit. I stand on legs weak and trembling. I've lived in darkness weeks, months, it seems eternal. The magistrates wear clean white linen lace. Lydia Gilbert, there art here indicted, not having the fear of God, for thou hast given entertainment to the great enemy of God. His help hath killed Henry Stiles' body. I see my torn and dirty hymns, hose and cuffs. The magistrates wear clean white linen lace. Besides other witchcrafts, according to God's law, thou deservest death. In clean white linen lace, they ask for words from me. What's there to say? I gaze as demons dressed in pure pressed linen lace condemn me. Decide I cannot longer live while Satan smirks across each liar's face. Okay, enough for Lydia now. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna, I wanna read you a couple poems in the voice of Kate. And I want you to know that Kate, the story of motherhood became a really big um, thing with Kate's voice because Kate is lucky enough to meet and fall in love with a man she adores and is happy with and has three children. So when I was writing this book, one of the things I did is I had a group of readers I gave things to read to. And I said, ask me questions you wanna know. Two of my first readers were also young mothers who had recently had babies. And both of them said, since these are midwives, I wanna know about birth. I wanna know about motherhood. And so Kate, because she has given birth, also can talk to us about, um, about childbirth and motherhood. And so I'm gonna read you two short poems from the voice of Kate. A Liquid Journey. Mary's my midwife as I bring little Sarah to life in this world. I remember Rebecca's soft birthing and try again writhing the pulls in my belly. They feel like the wildest of waves, a wash over the true love's deck rail on our ocean sail. Lonesome, Lydia not here with me. Reaching out over the gray place to lands where the dead reside, thinking I feel her hands reach out from rough seas to quiet my shuddering limbs. I'm no stranger to the mysteries labor can bring. In the minutes that come between, <coughs> first, I keep moving and making things orderly, smooth and neat around me. <coughs> then to our bed I go, follow these watery dreams. I am plunging low glimpsing the treasures there, swimming beside this child, gliding through a passageway leading to grottos where light shines on chests full of sunken gems and gold bounties. Mindful, my journey contains all the power of opening pains and the knowledge of clamping pulls. Mary call. It's pushing time, bear on down, lift your arms, embrace this red-faced, sweetly wiggling girl. And a dream from Kate as a mother called Verdant. With two daughters now, one toddling, one in arms and both at my breasts, I dreamed myself as a native woman, 
in hide skirt with naked chest. I dreamed each girl was nursing a fountain of milk flowing into a wa flowing onto the earth from my nipples. These became a rivulet and then a creek. And finally they flowed into a wide river. I stood in a verdant pasture where many creatures watched us, fat rabbits, flying geese, dun mares. Even white spotted leopards basked in observation while my little, little ones lifted their voices to sing. Okay, well, you're saved from more of the story because we're it's 1059. So, so I really appreciate you listening to me all this time, this whole long hour. I hope you've enjoyed it and I'm really open for questions or comments. Thank you. That was a beautiful, beautiful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I hope I can hear you again. Where are you going to be next? Well, um, I haven't got, I've got something lined up. I'm having a book party on May 20th. And I'm also, it is, I'm calling it a celebration of appreciation because I'm also inviting uh, some of the participants that have been in workshops or listened to my poem and given me advice to participate and read as well. So it's going to be at East Village Arts. Um, on First Avenue North and East Lake on May 20th, which is, I mean, May 19th. It's a Thursday night. I changed it to a Thursday because too many people had graduations on Friday night. Uh, and it's going to be a free event. We're going to have food and music and um, it should be a lovely time. It's a big space. So it feels pretty safe because it's big and airy. Um, so I'd love to see some of you all there. I'll be reading some other pieces that I didn't read tonight. Thank you well, so much. Appreciate You're it. a wonderful storyteller. You make us feel like we're right there. Thank oh, you for thank a beautiful you. presentation. Thank you so much. That's a fascinating period of time, too. I, I'm glad to hear that you had all that archaeology behind you. Well, I was really lucky because I would not have, if I had not had the things that um, my, um, call him my Sioux researcher. <laughs> Brought to me that I would might have turned away from this project because I really couldn't imagine loving anything that happened then. We, think about what we got in school. We got the crucible, we got the scarlet letter, and we got, I mean, that's what I got besides those pictures of the first Thanksgiving. And first of all, both of those books are written by men and neither of them, I mean, I, I admire many things about Hester Prince, but She's really not, she's really, we never hear what's happening from her perspective. It's That's always true. somebody else's interpretation. And, you know, these stories happen. Catherine's, um, Catherine is uh, accused in 1668 and Lydia in 1654. And Salem doesn't happen until 1692. So, and even then, the women are all made insane. So, you know, I don't know what really happened behind Salem, but what I did learn in my research is most of the issues that brought women to an accusation of witchcraft had to do with money. You know, either they had money that you wanted or they were asking for money that you didn't want to give them. And that is really the story of Catherine and Lydia. Lydia, um, Henry dies, and, and I didn't explain that, but he dies three years before she's accused of witchcraft and killing him. And she and her nephew Thomas asked for what they're owed from the estate. And because Lydia can write and has kept the books, she writes up the request, but has Thomas sign it. And Thomas only signs, and this is really, I've seen that document, Thomas signed it with an X. But um, they requested from, the Styles estate, the money they were owed. And I feel as if that may have been the impetus for the accusation. Um, and Catherine or Kate, her husband had a very, very, they had a very um, productive farm. They were doing very well. He died young and he made her 
the executrix of the estate and gave her, gave all the money of the estate to the girls when they married and to her as the executrix. That was absolutely not done in Puritan culture. Um, and so you can, so some of the, I know that because I've seen that document, but you have to imagine what might have happened if you had three daughters approaching uh, adolescence who are gonna get 60 pounds each when they marry. They're gonna become a very popular target. You also have a widow with a, an estate that was valued at around a hundred pounds. Um, you're also going to be a popular target for the men in the community. And in the story I've written, Kat, Kate and her husband, John, are very much in love and Kate is not interested in marriage. So you see that they can easily become a target. And I haven't talked much about the targeting of Kate by the community, but read the book because it happens. And most of what I have about that is based on documents I've been able to get my hands on because luckily there were a lot there was a lot more documentation about Kate's trial the transcripts of her trial were available a letter she wrote to the magistrates was available so I was able to look that over and use my imagination in combination with the testimonies I've read and the letter Kate wrote to make this real for you as a reader um, I hope that's what I've heard anyway you made it real. That's when I just lost it. That's when I cried. So, you know, if I made Nancy Wick cry, <laughs> I'm pretty proud of myself. <laughs> but I should I should sell the book with a box of cleaning. Or a nice cloth handkerchief. Can well, I, uh, this is a dumb question. Yes. Well, what about the mold on the bread? Where does that fit in? Um. The mold on the bread, well, there's something about moldy bread when they're crossing on the uh, ship. Because um, of course, when they're on a when you're on a boat crossing the sea for four months, the bread's gonna get moldy. And I I, I didn't think I read something about moldy bread, but there is a poem where I where they I talk about um, the birds turning away from the moldy bread that they try to offer on the ship but you know once you've been really i was just floored by what it was like must have been like to be in that hole of a ship for four months with around 80 people in a room smaller than my living room how did people survive you know and I, somehow that really hit me deeply and causing me to have a rise up of emotion and then voices and then suddenly I started I went to my retreat after that and I was there for a week and I was writing 10 poems a day um and during that time I was really lucky because I was at Mar with Marilyn Nelson I don't know if you're familiar with her she writes historical poetry um and she the first time I really read historical poetry written in the voice of the character was in her book Carver a Life in Poem where she tells the life of George Washington Carver. Now she doesn't do it in his voice because she felt like his voice was out there enough, but she writes it in the voices of all the different people that he met through his life. And when I saw that, I thought, you know, this is the kind of writing I really want to do. And I heard she had this retreat, so I applied to go there. And she usually had lots of poets there besides herself. It was, uh, I think there were six bedrooms there at the retreat. But the time I went, she'd forgotten to book anybody else but me. <laughs> so we were, I was, I had, I didn't have to worry about anybody else. I didn't have to talk to anybody else all day long. I, it was just me and the pond and the river and this beautiful land of Connecticut and um, places I could go and write. And I was, the voices of these women were just coming like crazy. But Marilyn was so generous with me that at night she would say, hey, read me what you wrote today. So we would have dinner together and then we'd sit on, on her patio and we, I would read the poems. And after a day or two, she said to me, she said, I'm just wondering, what if these women were witches? I had never had that thought. I really approached this as, I wanna know the lives of ordinary women and what they went through. 
and share that. But I had to open my mind to that. And so although um, I don't want to give too much away, but there are moments when a, um, I would not call it witchiness. I would call it like these characters intuitive genius, their um, deep empathy and their healing capacity can come to the forefront and you can say, hmm, that seems a little witchy. Um, but I, I'm of a belief that, you know, we may all, I mean, these are my ancestors. I know I carry some of those qualities. Um, but I also know that right now, you know, we have this, this is something that I kind of talk about a lot too, is we have these two media images of witches that popular culture has given us. There's the one that John Damas used in, 19, in the 1960s when he wrote about Lydia of they must be evil, mean, terrible, awful people, okay? Uh, with warty noses and loud voices and ugly hair and all this stuff, okay? Or the more current popularization of witches has been in all these shows. I mean, you all, we, I had a daughter who watched Charmed and um, well, I can't remember some of the other ones. Practical Magic and all those shows we watched a million times together. And in those is there's always somebody who's got a power, but hasn't really accepted it. And then they accept it. And then when the evil comes, they can win against evil because of their magic powers. <laughs> but the real, that, I mean, that's, you know, you think of Harry Potter, think of all these things that almost always happens. The witch wins because she's powerful. Well, you know, there must be something else like the ordinary woman who has an instinct or has compassion or has an ability to help others who is accused unfairly, but actually doesn't have that much power that they can overcome evil and a whole community turning against them. It's, you know, they don't have that kind of power. And, and because of that, I mean, because, I mean, I don't know if it's because of that, but I look at what's going on now in this world where people are, neighbors are turning against neighbors in Texas or in Florida because of new laws, where teachers are being attacked in communities by what they, for what they teach, when people are being watched in the classroom as at UAB now, every, every lecture is taped. Um, and you don't know where that's going to go. Is that coming from the state? And so we even, even though we think we're free of this kind of thinking now in our modern age, it is just rising back up again, trying to co control people's thinking and people's behavior. So it's actually much more real than I even dreamed it was going to be at this point in time. <laughs> I mean, I've spent, I started this book uh, 14 years ago and worked on it for not all the time. I worked on it for about two or three years. I took off and went, to, went and got my master's. I came back and worked on it and then waited for two years for it to get published. Not really understanding, even as I was working on it, how all these issues were gonna rise back up right now. And community members turning against community members is being encouraged by parts of the government. There's a lot uh, of sca scapegoating. I think the scapegoating was prevalent back then too. Yeah, I mean, it was. And I think that many people, I mean, you think of going to a completely wild world. Most of these folks never lived in a, a frontier. And how you could easily think everything out there is evil and satanic. Or you could be like Lydia and love it because it's new and beautiful and not full of plague and funeral pyres. So not everyone had to think the way they were directed to think. But if you didn't think that way, you let, you let yourself open for condemnation and scapegoating from the community. It can happen. Other thoughts or questions or anything? Liz, thank you very much. And if there is not one more question, then we will end it for today. Hey, I want to just thank y'all so much. And I want to thank the UAB New Horizons program for inviting me 
and for Nancy for inviting me. And I really hope that you all will become readers and share the word um, if you like. And um, I wish you all very well. Thank you so much. <laughs>